All right, this is our lesson 1.10 for our pre-calc 12 class. Unit 1 is called Functions and Transformations. Lesson 10 is called Domain and Range. What we're going to learn in this lesson is how to identify the domain and range of a function. We're also going to talk about um, what are some common domain restrictions that we'll look at in this class. All right, so domain uh, is a set of all possible values for the input of a function. Um, input, we also call this the independent variable. Um, and we also, another way to say this is that um, all possible values of x that you can put into a function. Um, that idea is not new before, hopefully. We've talked about that previously in this unit. Um, and up to this point, we've kind of hinted at domain and range. I've showed you notation for domain and range. But now we're actually going to focus on this for the lesson and the homework. There are two types of domain restrictions at this point. Um, the first one is involving radical functions. Uh, for example, for f, as defined here, is the square root of x. You can't take the square root of a negative number. In fact, the smallest number you can take a square root of is zero. So um, whatever is inside of a radical can be greater than zero, but it has to at least be zero. So we're going to say um, it has to be greater than or equal to zero. And now we have this notation here. We have a D for domain, and we have a colon, and then we have what I like to affectionately call mustache brackets. But what this really is is this set notation and so I'm going to write, okay, my domain, we have three pieces here. One, we're talking about x. And then we have a bar. And two, we're talking about the restrictions on x. And we have a comma. And then three, we define what x is. So x is an element of all real numbers. Any real number could be x, um, except here's the restriction. So if... Uh, and then my analogy I gave in class was like, uh, the domain is like all the people in, in the king's domain, or his dominion. And, and x would be the element of all the people in the land. And then the king threw a party, and that was his domain. And here's the invitation list. If, you, if your x value is greater than or equal to zero, then you are invited to the king's party. If you are not greater than or equal to zero, you were not invited to the king's party. At least not this party. But that's kind of how you read this thing. Um, on your homework assignment, if you have to answer a question in set notation, uh, the highlighted piece right here is the one thing you'll have to input. I think the rest is kind of a format given to you. And I also think they put this piece in front of the comma, and they put the inequality after the comma, but heard it both ways. Okay, radical functions is one domain restriction. The other common domain restriction is rational functions. So if your function consists of a fraction where the numerator and the denominator are separate functions, and mostly when um, we care about the denominator, um, as you may know, you cannot divide by zero. Our explanation for that is if you have uh, 10 cookies and you have two friends, and you divide your 10 cookies evenly amongst your two friends, what we're doing is we're taking 10 and putting it into, into two different groups, two different buckets. Um, 10 divided by 2 is 5, so that means each friend would get 5 cookies. 5 for you, 5 for you is a total of 10 cookies, and two friends. If we applied that same cookie story to 10 divided by 0, it wouldn't make any sense. If we tried, we would say 10 cookies, and you split them amongst zero friends. You can't split something in zero ways. It doesn't make sense. It's also sad that you have no friends. Bad joke. I'm sorry. I couldn't resist. I tried. Anyways, so the bottom line is you can't divide by zero. So if we're given a rational exponent or rational expression, we uh, say, OK, that thing on the bottom of the fraction cannot equal zero. So in this case, uh, j of x can't equal zero. So again, x is all the people in the kingdom, um, or x is what we're talking about, 
X is the element of real numbers, which means real numbers are the people in the kingdom. And here's the invitation list. Here's who's invited to the party. Everyone's invited to the party, except for one person. Wow, King, you just called out zero. You did zero dirty. Dang. Anyways. All right, range is similar, except instead of talking about X values, range is talking about Y values, the vertical axis. It's all possible values for the output. Another way of saying that is it's the dependent variable. It depends on the independent variable, which is the domain. So whatever uh, you can get in the range is dependent on what was in the domain in the first place. For square root of X function, the domain was only zero and up. So zero and positive numbers, which means that the if you square root a number, um, it's going to stay positive. You can't square root a positive number and get a negative. Uh, zero, if I square root zero, it goes to zero. If I square root one, it goes to one. If I square root two, it's about 1.2 something. If I square root four, it's going to go to two. I'm going to keep going. The range is going to keep going up, albeit at a slower rate. But we can conclude that it is never going to be lower than zero or it's never going to be negative. So now we're saying, okay, King's got an after party, and here's who's, in, who's the kind of people who are invited to the after party. These people are all real numbers, and here's the invitation list. All the Y values have to be greater than or equal to zero. All right, so our second function is an X squared function. Um, and I picked X squared just to highlight uh, some uh, to highlight the fact that the range is dependent on what's in the domain. It's like all the people who are invited to the range party uh, are only picked from the domain party. You can't go and pick somebody who wasn't invited to the domain to bring them to the range party. So the range party is really the after party. You know, because math class is a party, and after math class is the aftermath party. Huh? Get it? See what I did there? Aftermath party. Anyways, all right, so if I take any number in the domain, because you can put any number in here, so all not real numbers are in the domain of x, um, and I square that number, um, I'm only going to get a positive answer. Think about it, a negative square is a positive, zero squared is zero, and a positive square is going to be positive. So the range is only going to have positive numbers, or y values greater than or equal to zero. Mm -hmm. All right, enough about domain and range. Here's what your homework's going to look like. Your first set of skills are going to be given a graph. What's the domain? And so we can write it a couple ways. We could write it as an interval notation. That's with our square and curly brackets accordingly. We could write it um, as set notation with the mustache brackets. And so the things to look out for for the domain for this graph, I'm um, looking at just the x values. If I list all the ordered pairs that make up this curve, and I collect all the x values of those ordered pairs, the smallest x value would be 2, and I would get every x value, every number greater than 2, all the way to infinity. So we could write it uh, square bracket 2 to infinity. The square bracket means that 2 is invited to the party. Or we can write this as set notation, x is greater than or equal to 2. The next example, we have this graph that looks like um, this graph keeps going down to the left, but to the right, it looks like it's going to hit a, a vertical asymptote. And so what that means is as x approaches, as the graph approaches the x value of 2, it's going to just go straight vertical. It's going to keep getting closer and closer to 2, but there will always be a gap between the curve and the number 2, that vertical line. It's kind of ambiguous to tell just looking at these graphs, because we don't know what the functions look like. But you can assume for this assignment that if we start going straight vertical, straight up, or straight flat, there's going to be an asymptote, and there's going to be a, um, a boundary there. And so in this case, um, because we're assuming this is a vertical asymptote, we're going to say it's going to approach 2, 
but it's never going to be equal to 2. So we say x is strictly less than 2. Um, it could be less than 2, so negative infinity to 2. Since it can't be equal to 2, it's a null bracket, not a square bracket. And then we can write a set notation again. Um, and then, reminder, 2 is not invited to the t party, but every number less than 2 is invited. So that's domain. Um, here's a couple more domain examples, and you can look through those. We're going to say the first one starts at an x value of negative 5, and it ends at an x value of negative 1. Negative 5 and negative 1 both being invited to the t party. So we can write it as a compound inequality. We can write it as an interval with double square brackets. And we can put that in double inequality into um, set notation. Example D, it looks like there's two vertical asymptotes, one at negative 3 and one at 6. Um, every other x number before, in between, and after those two numbers seem to be on the curve. So we can write, instead of an inequality, we'll just say x cannot equal negative 3 or 6. So the king is specifically calling out those two numbers. You are not invited to the tea party. Don't worry, you are, but those numbers aren't. Never mind. We can write this as three intervals uh, conjoined with a, a u. So, so negative infinity up to negative 3 in unison with negative 3 to 6 in unison with 6 to infinity. Um, and we use null brackets to exclude the negative 3 and to exclude the 6. And then we correct that notation as well. Okay, now going back to the same examples, but looking at the range, looking at the y values. For example, A, <coughs> if you looked at all the set of ordered pairs, the lowest y value would be 0. And this graph goes up pretty flat, but not asymptote-like flat. Like, it's still going up. It's not, like, petering out entirely. So this thing, we can say, even though it's going to go much slower than example B, it is going to keep going up and up and up to infinity. There is no ceiling to how high this can go. Since 0 is included, we invite that to the 0 to the t party, the square bracket. And we can write it y is greater than or equal to 0. Example B, um, to the right, it's going up. To the left, it's going down. There doesn't appear to be any sign that there's an asymptote. So we can assume this thing goes from negative infinity all the way up to positive infinity. So I, I think this is probably a little redundant here, but for our set notation, to keep the same, I just put y. Although you could probably just put all real numbers and be good. Because any number between negative infinity and infinity would fit. All right, uh, the next ones. All the y values, for example, c, go as low as 0 and as high as 2. And I think we can guesstimate that 2 is invited to the party. So we're going to use square brackets. And here's our compound inequality. For d, um, I could just look at the middle curve. Because it goes up to infinity, down to negative infinity, and everything in between, including 0. The left goes all the negative numbers up to zero, but not including zero. So it looks like there's a somewhat asymptotic right there. It flattens out. And to the right, we have all the positive numbers, and it's approaching zero. But the middle curve part of the same graph does cross at zero. So again, this would be all real numbers. Boom. Everyone's invited to the party. Aww. All right, so some examples with numerical expressions. The examples here rely on the one domain restriction, and that is that the denominator can't equal zero. So for the domain, we're going to take that denominator, put an inequality sign or an unequal sign, and say, okay, this thing can't equal zero. And then we're just going to solve this as if that was an equal sign. So subtract 16 from each side, divide each side by 8 and we get x can equal negative 2, which makes sense. If x equals negative 2, we have 8 times negative 2 is negative 16. Negative 16 plus 16 is 0, 
and we said it can't equal zero, which means we can't use negative two as x. If we invite negative two to the party, he's just gonna mess everything up. So he's not invited, okay? Example B, same domain restriction, the bottom cannot equal zero. In this case, the algebra we're gonna use is we're gonna factor. We have a trinomial, so we're gonna factor. And the only way to make uh, this factor times this factor equal zero, which is what's not allowed, is if either one of these factors or either one of these binomials is equal to zero. So if, uh, for example, zero times anything is zero. So if x is eight, this will be zero. So x cannot be eight. Also, anything times zero is zero, which means if x is negative seven, this will be zero. So negative seven is also kicked out of the party because he can equal zero. So then here's our domain restriction. There's just two numbers that aren't invited to the party. So we can write our set notation accordingly. Okay, example C, we have a radical. The thing inside the radical has to be greater than or equal to zero. So we're gonna solve this sucker. And we're gonna add 42 to each side, divide each side by six. And we say, okay, x has to be a number greater than or equal to seven. If x is seven, we have six times seven, which is 42, minus 42, which is zero. So equals to seven is gonna give us square root of zero. Anything greater than seven means we're multiplying the six x to be bigger than 42, which means anything bigger than 42 minus 42 is gonna be in the positive range. And so that'll keep it, that'll work. So we just can't take the square root of a negative. It's not allowed. Example D, what a wonderful example. It puts both of our domain restrictions together. It's underneath a fraction, so that thing can't be zero. And the thing under the fraction is also inside a radical. So the thing inside the radical underneath that fraction has to be greater than or equal to zero. If I take can equal zero, and I take greater than or equal to zero, and I overlap those two things, we kick zero out. So we can't have a zero at the bottom. Um, the radical can be greater than or equal to zero, we just get rid of the equals part. The radical has to be greater than zero. It can't be equal to zero because the radical is also the denominator. So we're just going to say 2x plus 8, without the square root, is greater than 0. Now we're going to solve for x. A quick reminder, when you're solving an inequality, if you ever, like we divided by 6 here to get the x by itself, we divide by 2 here to get the x by itself. If you ever divide by a negative number, you have to flip the inequality. Think about it. Negative 2 is greater than negative 10. But if I divide negative 2 and negative 10 each by negative 2, it becomes 1 and 5. Well, negative 2 is bigger than negative 10, but uh, 1 is less than 5. So when you ever divide by a negative, you have to flip the inequality. So don't forget about that. Takeaway, we now know how to identify domain and range from a function and from the graph. Um, and we know how to evaluate domains from the function notation. Our two restrictions so far are radicals and fractions. That was a long lesson, but you stuck with it. Good on you.